to travel to other worlds. Until recently, this seemed to be an impossibility. But great new discoveries have brought us to the threshold of a new frontier, the frontier of interplanetary space. Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Planet Ping Pong Podcast, the podcast that's all about table tennis news, reviews, discussions, and now interviews. And I'm not going to talk a whole lot because we have a pretty cool interview with Jeremy Hazine, one of the best players of North America and a representative of Canadian table tennis over at the 2021 Olympics in Tokyo. He is the youngest ever Canadian national champion and has played, medaled, and even been the champion of other major tournaments like the Pan Am Games, the Westchester Open, and so on. This was a pretty fun interview to do, and I just want to give one more quick shout out and thanks to Jeremy Hazin for taking the time to do this interview with me. And with that, let's just get started with the interview. So now I am joined by currently ranked number six in Canada and one of the best table tennis players here in North America and an overall solid dude. I am joined by Jeremy Hazine. How are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How are you? Ah, you know, I'm kicking. I'm kicking. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wanted to ask, and this is something that I, I'm really curious about, not just for you in particular, but just for table tennis in general. My question right off the bat is, while this whole corona, quarantine, pandemic thing is going on, how are you training? Are you still going to the club? Or are you still hitting the table? Or do you have a setup at home? How, how is the training looking for you? Um, at the beginning, I had a setup at home. I had a table in my basement. So I would practice uh, almost every day uh, in my basement. Obviously, the space is not a lot. It's just a basement area. And then I'd do some fizz fitness training. I'd go outside for a jog. And starting May 20, I was able to go to the club for some training. Oh. So now I'm just going to the club like almost every day for the last, last two months. So mm-hmm. I'm getting back into it slowly. Is it still kind of like a limited capacity type of thing where only a few players can go in at a time or is it full everybody's back in? Uh, kind of. They say it's limited capacity, but the club could get packed sometimes. Mm. But not most of the time, but sometimes it could get a bit packed. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Luckily, you don't have to train with a mask on, do you? No, 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 no. I don't have to. Yeah. I don't think I'm able to anyway. <laughs> It'd be too sweaty and hard to breathe. Yeah, uh, because I've done uh, a few like sports exercise type of things with a mask on, and like I can go to work, I can do anything with a mask on, but training that gets a little bit hot. But yeah, I I assume you know what I mean. <laughs> yeah. And so next, because you're currently ranked number six in Canada, right? Mm-hmm. And for a long time, you've been playing since you were quite young, right? Yes. So I wanted to ask you, because from a few media outlets, especially in the beginning portions of your career, you were seen as kind of like this Canadian uh, youth prodigy in the world of table tennis. Yes. I want to talk about, and I want you to just tell us about that path that you took from being this child prodigy in North American table tennis and talk about that journey until you qualified for the 2020 Olympics. Uh, yeah, it was a very long journey because uh, when I was young, I just started as recreational. So I never imagined today I'll be like an Olympian, that kind of level. So when I was about 13, I played the National Team Challenge event, which I placed fifth in all of Canada. So in that event, I got fifth. So that's when I was regarded as a project for Canadian table tennis. So I slowly built it from year to year. Uh, and then eventually I was able to win some under 15 international titles. And then in the under 18 category, I won many bronze medals in Pan American championships and also some international like junior circuits. And also I won Canadian championship, the national championship for men's. Uh, I won twice and yeah, and here I am today as an Olympian. So slowly converting to the men's game. Kind of. Along that path, though, do you have any like specific tournaments or any specific memories that you want to 
point out at all because they were so memorable or anything like that? Uh, a memorable moment? Uh, I would say uh, winning the Canadian National Championship for men's singles. That was a very memorable moment because it's not easy to win such a title like that. Especially you have a lot of players who were born in China, right? Uh, a lot of former Olympians competing. Or, yeah, so it was very honorable to win that event. And also at the Pan Am Junior Championship, I would say it's also a very memorable event because I got a bronze medal for the a singles men's double and the mixed double so three bronze medals in that one event that was very good achievement for me on the international stage yeah. and just kind of tying into what you said there you said that in canada at least and probably in america as well but in here in canada a lot of the table tennis players that we have a lot of them are chinese born and then they immigrated over to canada i just yeah. ask you what do you think is unique about that group compared to the rest of the Canadian born players. Do you find any differences in between the two groups? Uh, definitely. I think the main thing is the culture makes a big difference because in China, they take table tennis very seriously. And from little, they didn't go to school at all. They just focused every day training five to six hours a day from when they're eight years old and they train for years, years. So years go by and they develop this habit of enjoying the sport and training hard. Whereas in Canada, we don't really see table tennis as a career, right? We just see it as like a hobby and then, okay, you'll go to school in the end anyway. So just do it as a hobby to pass time. But in China, they take it as serious sport, just like we take hockey in Canada. Yeah. And I talked about this with uh, a few other people, Matt Hetherington in particular, but he said that a lot of people in China will focus more on the, on the actual technical aspects of the strokes. Yeah stuff do you find that difference in between the chinese born players and the canadian born players as well well for the chinese style of training i think they should worry more about technique which they are doing because they play so many hours once you have the right foundation you're set for life that's why when those um, chinese players come to canada they don't practice or maybe they coach some other players but this their technique is still built in they still have a very good technique because when they were young they built a solid foundation mm -hmm. uh, but for us in Canada, we can't really work on technique all the time because we don't train as much, as many hours. So we got to work more on tactics, strategy, uh, ball placement, just like some European players are doing. They have to kind of make up for what they're missing because for sure on the technique part, we cannot catch up with China. So we must find other ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, no, that, that totally makes sense. And again, going to the top of Tokyo 2020, how was the qualifying tournament? Well, how was that for you? Was, were you nerve-wracked? Were you nervous or just or excited? Walk me through that. Oh, very nervous. <laughs> I've actually never been more nervous than ever. Like, very, very nervous. Um, you know, you train so many years just for one single event, and you really want to do your best. You don't want to screw up, you know? I say to myself, you know, I want to try my best. Whatever happens, happens, right? But in reality, I really want to make it. I say I want to just try my best, but in reality, you really want to make it, which really puts a lot of extra pressure on myself. And in the final game, I played very well, like not like very confident. And I was able to handle all the pressure. That's why I was able to qualify. But definitely, it was a very, very like nerve wracking event for me. Where was the, the qualifying tournament held, actually? Kitchener. Uh, Waterloo area is somewhere in Ontario, like about an hour, an hour ish away from Toronto. Yeah. Yeah. And you're based at Toronto, right? Yeah. The North, like Toronto. So Richmond Hill, like the suburbs. Okay. Yeah. I've actually never been to Toronto. I okay. am Canadian and I've been in a bunch of places, but Toronto's the one major city I haven't been to. <laughs> okay. And I guess going forward from that, but really the olympics in general is such a prestigious moment for table tennis but it's also kind of a unique moment in table tennis as well because usually when you go to the big tournaments like you know the china open the japan open it's usually a, a very small select amount of players that can actually qualify and they usually tend to be from um you know pretty similar countries like you have the chinese team the japanese team the korea yeah. it's a bit rare to see 
players in like China Open from like, you know, the US or Mexico and so on. But uh, the Olympics, that it's a really, it's a moment where it gives a spotlight to all these smaller countries to compete. So I want yes. to ask you, what are your expectations for 2020 Tokyo? Um, my expectations is to just do the best I can because it's really my first time playing at such a major event. There's going to be a lot of spectators and a lot of audience, and it's going to be a big hall with high ceilings. So the ball, the feeling of the ball will be a bit different and a lot of wind for sure. Cause the bigger the venue, the more wind you'll feel. So definitely it all has an effect. Um, so I don't really have any expectations. Just try my best. Uh, of course, the first match will be the qualification round. Hmm. I think it's, one or two matches I have to win and then I go to the main job. So my goal is, would be to win the first qualification match for sure. Mm -hmm. Just at least try to win that. Once I win that step by step, I can build my confidence and maybe do even better. But for sure, definitely to win the first match would be a big accomplishment if I was able to do it. So I'm aiming for that. Yeah. Yeah. And are there any countries that you're kind of under, that are kind of like on the radar for you that you kind of need to be careful? Of course, you know, China, Korea, Japan, Germany and so on those countries are like the top hitters of table tennis but are there any other smaller countries that you're kind of a bit worried about or some that you can't put your guard down um it depends on like world ranking definitely because the way they do the seating would be based on world ranking so most likely I'll play somebody maybe like the lowest players from Asia or maybe some European top players because like my world ranking right now is like about 140 something like that one or 156 to be exact but at the highest it was 141 so it's around that which means in the first match I'm probably playing against somebody ranked 70 to 80 or 60 or even 50 if I had a bad draw maybe even 40 but I don't think that really makes a difference because sometimes I was able to challenge like top 100 players so make some matches with them I was able to challenge them so it doesn't matter really who I play just do my best study their game before the match and go in with a good attitude and do my best. And you kind of mentioned that the venue itself is really important when you're playing because the yeah. venue can actually change the feel of the ball, like you said, the, the size, the width, all that kind of stuff. Which part uh, of the venue itself do most people tend to miss when we're watching it on TV or something, but are really important? Oh, the part of the venue. Um, I would say um, the feel of the ball because people, when they're watching, they don't really know, like they have an idea of how tall the hall is or if the ball bounces fast or slow, you know, some players, I know some players who just can't play in big arenas. They just play, tend to play a bit worse. So on TV, you may think, oh, this guy's not very good, but actually it's the hall he doesn't have the feeling for. But obviously that's not an excuse. We should all get used to the hall as professionals, right? But for sure, definitely, the balance of the ball. Every single hall, every, even every table has different feeling. Table one, whether it's table two, are you closer to the door, the exit? Are you closer to the washroom? It makes it big. It all has a factor. Very important details. Huh. Well, I actually, uh, so I've been keeping up with table tennis for a long time. But that's actually something that surprises me. I didn't know that, like, even the placement of the table in the room or whatever. I didn't know that. Yeah. Role. Definitely. It had a big impact because hmm, yeah. I've played the big one before like Japan Open China Open Hong Kong Open and the first one or Qatar Open I played also but the, even Qatar Open that's the first time I really played in such a big hall and I just wow like just totally different feeling I felt like I couldn't even play 10% mm -hmm. of my level like the first two sets I couldn't even loop the ball on the table like really weird feeling huh. but eventually you kind of get used to it it's all a matter of warm up you know Go there a few days before the tournament. Get some good warm-up. You know, once you're used to the hall, it's easy. You won't even feel it. You won't even feel the difference. You just have to get used to it one or two days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And how does your training camp look like for Tokyo 2020? Because I assume that because the Olympics are such, it's such a high prestige event, are you taking the training for that bit differently or is it just business as usual? Uh, yeah, for sure. I'll make some special preparations before the games. Uh, it really depends on the coronavirus situation right now. Probably going to other countries to train. Uh, I've been to China to train a lot. Uh, maybe I want to try Korea or Japan because they're also very high level and the ball, they're very fast on their feet and I need to be keep up with their speed for sure. 
So definitely, I'm looking forward to going there, or maybe even going to Europe, as I haven't really gone to Europe that much in my career. So some training camps with some high-level players is definitely what I need because I'm I don't know who I'm going to play in the Olympics, whether it's a lefty, righty, what kind of style. So I need a group of players who are high level and they all have different playing styles. Definitely. Yeah. So you're looking maybe for that diversity. Yeah. Gotcha. And I guess leading on from that, um, what country do you want to go and train in? Because you mentioned that you've trained in China and you've trained, I assume in the, in the U S as well, but what, yeah, for sure. The target country that you just kind of want to try training in for a little bit. Uh, actually, I want to try Japan or Korea. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One, or the, one of the two because um, their training style is actually similar to the Chinese style. It's based off the Chinese style, more on working on technique. But uh, they also incorporate some strategy, some strategy and placement training. And they also, their speed, um, they're definitely not, they're not as powerful as the Chinese, but they're actually faster than the Chinese. The ball is very fast when they play. But Chinese superior because of their power and their spin, right? But the Japanese, they only have speed, or Koreans only have speed, where they're lacking power. So that's why it actually looks like China is faster based on speed, but it's the power that's making the difference. Right. And you kind of touched a little bit on this, but uh, a lot of countries, especially in Asia, they have like, each country has a bit of its own unique style, right? Yeah. And it's kind of a phenomenon that's not even just unique to table tennis. Like if you were to go look at the world of kickboxing or whatever, the Dutch will fight differently than the Germans and the Japanese will fight different than the Koreans. Now I kind of want to, because we've, everybody has kind of known about the difference in between Asian countries and European countries, but I actually want to get into the difference of styles in North America. And so, because you said that you've trained in the U S and you've been to the Pan Am Games, So I assume you oh, yeah. well, from so many different countries and areas of North America so I was going to ask, are there any differences that you've noticed in between the North American countries in terms of, you know, play style, strategy, uh, or basic training methods? Um, in North America, there's a not a lot of group training. So it's more like a one-to-one training uh, where you pay the coach or some training partner to practice with you for one hour and then whatever the rate is. So in Canada, it's like this. In U.S., they have a very good industry in the U.S. Like they have some clubs where they have six or seven high-level Chinese coaches who you take one-to-one lesson with them. So that's why I went to U.S. normally because they have a lot of variety of players. But it's all in one-to-one style and it's not in group training. Uh, where I, so that's why it focuses more on, on strategy because the coach is playing to help you improve because it's one-to-one training, right? Whereas in Europe or in Asia, you're in a group. So everybody is training for themselves, right? If I'm training with my opponent, my opponent wants to improve themselves and I want to improve myself. So it's kind of like we push each other to the next level. But in North America, we don't really have that environment. It's more like the coach or the training partner is helping you improve. Kind of like that's the main difference, which is a bit more focused on strategy. So less technique for sure. And what do you think, you kind of touched a little bit on that at the end there, but what do you think are the pros and cons of this one-to-one system compared to the group system that you would see in Europe? Uh, One-to-one system or short-term improvement, you will improve faster for sure. Because a one-to-one training can fix your technique a lot. The coach can feed you multi-ball, serve, receive. He can rally with you, play some matches with you, find out where areas need to improve in your game. So definitely that'd be a pro. But the con is that you need people around you to improve, people to kind of push. You need a group to say, you know what? If this guy's better, I want to be better than him. You need this kind of motivation to want to continue. And in Europe, there's like 10 to 20 tables of players playing. Whereas one-to-one training, it's just on one table. You're training with the guy, you know what I mean? Yeah. There's no really competitive environment, right? And so do you think that the change maybe from a a one-on-one system to maybe a group system like in Europe, do you think that would raise the ceiling, the the skill ceiling of North American players in the world scale? Um for sure it would. Like many players in the US go to Europe for training uh, and they improve a lot because they play some league, they're in a group. 
But uh, in my opinion, I want to mix, I like to mix one on one training with group training. So I believe you do need a high level training environment, some group training, but you definitely need to do, keep one to one training because you need to be able to fix your deficiencies and your weaknesses. So mixing some one to one training with group training would be the best. Like for me, my ideal training would be uh, one time per day in the morning, maybe some group training, afternoon one to one. Like you need a mix of both. That's what I think. Because sure. especially for me, I don't have a lot of time before Tokyo 2020. Like it's almost a year now. Mm -hmm. Time goes by really fast, like 12 months away, right? Whereas in group training, they'll stay in Europe two to three years. It's slow development. But over time, you're going to make a big jump. The development there is really slow. You're going to have to invest a lot of time in the sport if you want results. Right. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. And talking a bit more about table tennis in Canada, um, if you look at the, the rankings for table tennis in Canada, it's actually kind of interesting because you'll see that like the top 10, the majority of the people are from Ontario or mm -hmm. from uh, sometimes Quebec and BC. But I believe like the top, like the, the major players in the top 10, the more important ones are all from the Ontario area. Why do you think that is that Ontario is a bit more concentrated with that skill? We have a more, we have a better industry in Ontario. A lot of coaches in Ontario, high level in the Toronto area. And a lot of kids are willing to pay the coaches to train them one-to-one. -one. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of high level players and especially the players from China. Uh, most of them, they, they choose Toronto now. They're in for immigration. They choose Ontario. Uh, before it was BC, like 10 years ago maybe. But now the majority of the players, they settle in Toronto because the coaching industry it's good for them. They can make a better living in Ontario than they did in their home country of China. So, Right, I see. And so a lot of your coaches, are they Chinese-born coaches as well? Yeah, a lot of them. Almost all of them. <laughs> How many coaches do you have, actually? Um, at the moment, I just have a one main coach. Uh, and then I have a one assistant coach, like a training partner. So when I'm in Toronto, I would train with my head coach. And also my assistant coach, like my sparring partner, my main coach would plan the training for me and give me some high level training as the sparring partner would just, just practice with a sparring partner, just work on some skills I need to improve, just keep working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess kind of, again, keeping in with the theme of Canada and table tennis, but going back to the Olympics, how does it feel to represent Canada? Because Canada is such a country that has... A, a very big focus on a lot of sports too. Yeah. Table tennis is still very niche in this country. And so I wanted to ask you as a representative of Canadian table tennis, how does it feel representing table tennis in a sport, in a country, sorry, that is dominated mostly by stuff like hockey, soccer, and so on? Uh, it's definitely difficult because it's hard to get recognition, recognition, sorry, playing table tennis. Um, because we're not a very, not a lot of people know about the sport as a professional. Uh, so definitely, that's why I really want to make the Olympics, you know, because I feel like if I haven't made the Olympics, maybe I wouldn't even get any recognition that I play table tennis, right? So you want to kind of play those like Pan Am games, Olympic games. That's your only way as a Canadian athlete to get recognition for the sport that you're playing. Because the Olympics, they give you opportunity, all sports, right? Different categories, summer sports, winter sports. I feel like, yeah, I wouldn't get any recognition in general. Yeah, because, of course, Canada is such a diverse country, and there's so many people from different backgrounds. But table tennis is still one of those sports that's still quite niche. And so, yeah, I imagine that it's quite difficult to get uh, at least the same amount of recognition that, like, a hockey player would, right? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> And so, well, that was a really good conversation that we've had about just, you know, table tennis in general, table tennis in Canada. And I just kind of want to touch on just a bit more about you as a person, because, of course, table tennis is life, but it's not yeah. everything in life. Right. And so going by your Instagram, I see that you're a huge traveling fan. Yeah. <laughs> so I just want you to tell me, like, what's. First of all, what's the place that you've enjoyed the most? Uh, wow, that's a tough one. Um, uh, for sure, I'd say Hong Kong, for sure, because 
I like it a lot. And there's a lot of nice skyline, very beautiful. A lot of good food to eat. Uh, very good shopping, whether it doesn't matter, like whether you're a boy or a girl, they have shopping for everyone. Uh, they have a lot of concerts. It's kind of like the Hollywood of Asia, basically. Mm. A lot of movie production, films that are filmed in Hong Kong. Yeah, so definitely, I like Hong Kong. And also, uh, if, you have to give, if I have to give you a second one, maybe Dubai. <laughs> yeah, very nice there. And also Qatar is very nice. Very rich Middle Eastern countries, yeah. When you were in Hong Kong, because I, I, I went to Hong Kong for a little bit, did you go to Hong Kong Disneyland at all? Uh, no, <laughs> not at all, no. I've been to the, all the Disneylands and Disney Worlds in the U.S. already, so it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't have to go. There's much, many other things to see in Hong Kong. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I really enjoyed being in Hong Kong as well. And if you had to choose one place that you haven't been to yet, but a place that you really want to go, what would it be? Uh, maybe the Maldives. The Maldives. Or maybe... Because that place is for luxury, right? For beaches there. They have a lot of luxury beach resorts. Um, maybe like a city. I'd, I'd say Singapore. <laughs> I really want to try. Yeah. I, I like Singapore a lot, actually. Based on the photos and what I know about it. Yeah, I really want to go to Singapore. It's one of the places I want to go to. But uh, the most expensive thing about Singapore... I Sorry, the cheapest thing about going to Singapore okay. is the plane ticket. Cause yeah. Because I used to live in Japan. And going to Singapore, because I was planning on it with a few people, but the cheapest part was just a plane ticket because the hotel for like a week was like double the price of the plane. Oh, yeah, it's expensive. Especially if you're staying at those like Marina Bay Sands, those hotels with like the infinity pool on the top deck, like like those kind of hotels, very expensive. Yeah. <laughs> well, I do really want to go to Singapore one day. I'll get yeah. there day. And because, you know, we've touched on traveling and table tennis is a really important part of your life. But I just kind of want to talk about what are you interested in aside from table tennis? Uh, definitely uh, Chinese music. Yeah. Chinese music. What music do you like listening to? Like, uh, like Cantonese music, like Hong Kong music. It's called Canto pop music in Cantonese language. Yeah. And do you have any um, artists? Say that again. Oh, yeah. I have some. Uh, I have many favorite artists. It's really hard to decide from one. Uh, but if you check my Instagram stories, I go to many concerts. <laughs> yeah, whether it's in Asia or whether I watch the concert in China. Sometimes I watch in Toronto. I've watched some Chinese concerts even in Europe before. So I've watched a lot of concerts. Like Normally, like not including this year, more than 10 concerts, like maybe even more. I think 15 shows per year. Holy. So sometimes I would go like multiple nights for the same singer. Like I would watch one singer for three nights in a row sometimes, depending on my schedule. But about 15 shows, 15 plus per year. Yeah. Do you have a favorite concert music show that you've been to? Or they're all pretty? Uh, they're all pretty good. Uh, but I like... But from when I was younger, I always listened to a singer called uh, Sammy Chang. She is one of my favorite singers because when I was only six years old, I listened to her music. And when I was seven years old, in 2007, when she was in Toronto for a concert, I went to her concert at seven years old. Then when I was 19, I saw her concert in Hong Kong for three nights in a row. Yeah, last year. Oh, so I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah, no, that, that's... Yeah, I haven't been to too many concerts, if I'm being honest. But yeah, I, I do want to, I do like Hong Kong music. And I would love to go to a concert. Some oh yeah, in Hong Kong, they have so many concerts and many singers. They can have 20 nights sell out. Like more than half a million people, almost half a million people, they attend the concert over 20 nights. Like one singer can make more than 20 concerts in a row, back to back in Hong Kong. Do you have a particular artist that you haven't attended a concert for, but you really want to, or? Yeah, uh, for sure. Uh, Leon Lai. He is actually very famous, but he is actually more like a 1990s music. Uh, he, I listened to him for like four years now, about five years. And uh, right now he's my most favorite singer. And I always want to see a concert from him. Hopefully when the quarantine ends, 
I can find a way to see his concert. <laughs> because before he was very famous. Like in the 90s, he was selling out 25 nights concert in a row. Holy crap. I can't imagine how tiring that would be for him. Oh, yeah. The, it's interesting because uh, Asian singers in general, they're actually more popular than you think they are. Mm-hmm. Right? Especially like K-pop singers because they also have a very big fan, fan base in China. K-pop. Yes. And also like um, Hong Kong singers. They have a big market in China. Obviously with the population of China being 1.6 billion. In reality, most of them are actually more popular than some of the American singers they have today. But nobody would ever know that <laughs> because we're living in this kind of, in the North American side of the world, right? Definitely. So. Yeah. No, for sure. And with that, I think this was a pretty good conversation. I think yeah. Let's leave it at that. I just wanted to say, Jeremy, thank you again for agreeing to do this interview with me. And yeah, it was my pleasure. Yeah. Anytime. Totally. And... Of course, I wish you the best for your training, especially during this quarantine time. I hope you stay safe. And of course, I wish you nothing but the best for the upcoming 2020 Tokyo Olympics. Thank you. All right, I and wish you all the best too. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and with that, I think we'll leave it at here. Come back next time for some more conversation and discussion all about table tennis. And thank you all for listening. Thank you.